Good morning, everyone. As we continue studying the gospel as it was written by Mark, I wanted us to look at the deity of Jesus, but specifically the phrase, the Son of God. And I'm hoping that there's going to be a few surprises here for you, such as who confesses Jesus and who does not confess Jesus, who are comparative in confessing Jesus, what Son of God means, at least in Mark, why and when God calls Jesus his Son, how Jesus is accused of blasphemy, and actually, who blasphemes the Son of God. When we look at the book of Mark, I have categorized seven witnesses of Jesus' divinity. And you're going to see some of them this morning, but we're going to go over these in other sermons also. One is by Jesus himself, by Mark the writer, the third one by Old Testament prophets, by Jesus' disciples, by Jesus' enemies, by demons, and by Jesus' Father. You'll see this list again as we look at other ways the Gospel of Mark actually shows the divinity of Jesus. But get your Bibles, and let's start at the very beginning. As we've been doing, we are just going to be opening the book of Mark and reading a few scriptures here and there. Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, whether you realize it or not, Mark writing the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that was a shot across the bow, as we say nowadays. And I'm going to show you why. Because Mark wasn't just affirming the deity of Jesus. The book of Mark actually contrasts Jesus with another son of God. Now, if you don't know where I'm going, you soon will. Let's look at a few quotes. And I have only three I'm going to share with you, but I've got a whole lot more. When Atia had come in the middle of the night to the solemn service of Apollo, she had her litter set down in the temple and fell asleep, while the rest of the matrons also slept. On a sudden, a serpent glided up to her and shortly went away. When she awoke, she purified herself as if after the embraces of her husband. And at once there appeared on her body a mark in colors like a serpent. And she could never get rid of it. So that presently she ceased ever to go to the public baths. In the tenth month after that, Augustus was born and was therefore regarded as the son of Apollo. Apollo was a Roman god. If Augustus is the son of a Roman god, then Augustus is son of God. Here's another quote. In 42 BC, Julius Caesar was formally deified as the divine Julius. Caesar was also Dive Filius, which in Latin means the son of God. Roman coins from the same period in which Jesus lived were plentiful. On one side of the coin was a picture of Julius Caesar, who had been deified by the Roman Senate. So the Caesars were gods, and the Caesars were sons of God. And here's the last one. As ancient Roman poet Horace mourned the slaughter of the decade-long civil wars that Augustus finally ended, he asked, Whom shall Jupiter, the great God, assign the task of atoning for our sin? He suggested several divine candidates, but ended up with Augustus as the incarnated God who would do so. And why not Augustus? After all, Romans celebrated him as four ways divine. By ancestral descent from Venus and Anchises, 
by miraculous virgin birth from Apollo and Atia, which we read, by paternal adoption from the deified Julius Caesar, because Julius Caesar was also divine, according to Rome, and by official decree, one inscription from Egypt calls Augustus heaven's shining star. He is described as the divine father and the heavenly savior. New Testament scholar Dom Croson says that archaeological finds in the Roman world testify to Augustus' stature as nothing less than Lord, Savior, Redeemer, Liberator, Divine, Son of God, God, and God of God. So when Mark wrote the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and we remember that Mark was writing to a Roman audience, you can see how this was a shot across the bow. He is not just affirming the deity of Jesus. He is actually going to be contrasting that to the deity of the Caesars. Now, that might be hard for us to understand. But that is the beginning of Mark. A little bit more deep than maybe sometimes we give it credit. Let's look at some of the other passages where Jesus is called the Son. Chapter 1, verse 11. This is the baptism of Jesus. We've already talked about how the heavens were torn open, a spirit descended upon him, both of these from Isaiah. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. I want you to try to think, what is the point of God the Father in announcing, You are my beloved Son, with whom or with you I am well pleased at this particular point. We'll come back to that later. Chapter 1, verse 24. Here, Jesus is going to be driving out an unclean spirit. And this one doesn't use the term son, but I think it is a synonym for that. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, notice in this confession of this demon... You have both the humanity and the deity of Jesus being declared. Now, that was a harder concept for the Jews, we understand. But you see, Romans had no problem with a God being incarnated in flesh, did they? We've already talked about that. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried, You are the Son of God. Even the demons believed and shuddered, as James talks about. Chapter 5 and verse 7. Again, demons. This one's named a legion. And he cried out with a loud voice. Notice what happens right before that in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, here is the man that is actually being tormented or indwelled in by all of these demons. He ran and knelt before him and cried out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. For he had told him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And then chapter 8, 29. We've had Mark confess. We have had... 
the Father confess. We have had demons upon demons upon demons confess. And now here we have in 829, Jesus asking his apostles, who do people say that I am? And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, and look very closely in verse 29, Peter answered him, you are the Christ, the son of the, it doesn't say that, does it? In Matthew's account, we have Peter confessing Jesus not only as the Christ or Messiah, but as the son of the living God. In Mark's account, which was probably dictated by Peter to Mark, they decide to leave out Peter's confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why? Matthew has it, so we know that he said it. We know that he believed it. But here in Mark's account, it is left out. Think on that for a while. We might have an answer, but we might not. But it sure should strike you as curious as we study that phrase, the Son of God, and how it is used to describe Jesus as divine in the book of Mark. How again and again and again it appears. And yet in the confession of Peter, it is left out. Let's look at chapter 9 and verse 7. This is the transfiguration. This is the second time that the Father will be confessing Jesus. A cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved Son. Same verbiage as before. Listen to him. Again, I want you to think why these two times does the Father choose to, in the gospel written by Mark, confess Jesus as his son? One, the baptism, the other, transfiguration. I'll give you a suggestion later on that I think is valid, but you might have your own. Look at chapter 13, 32. This time, Jesus is confessing himself as the Son of God. He doesn't use the phrase Son of God, but he uses the word Son and Father. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay, so let's keep up. We've had Mark as the author or writer confess Jesus as the Son of God. We've had the Father. We've had demons. It's missing in Mark in Peter's confession, so we can't include Peter. And we have Jesus. So Mark, the Father, demons, and Jesus so far. 1461. Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. In verse 61, we find that he kept silent and did not answer. And again, the high priest, who would be Caiaphas, questioned him. Are you the Messiah, or Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? So, we find out that, while some people say that the Jews never understood the term Messiah or Christ to include divinity, here, 
the high priest of the Jews at that time did. Are you the son of the blessed one? A synonym or substitution for son of, of God. So we have not so much a confession by the high priest, but Jesus will say, look at verse 62, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They all condemned him as deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, Prophesy! The temple servants also took him and slapped him. So Jesus claiming to be the son of the blessed one, the Messiah, was considered blasphemy. Now look at the last time in the book of Mark where Jesus is confessed as the Son of God. Matthew chapter 15, verse 39. When the centurion, who was not just a common soldier, but a leader of at least a hundred men, who was standing opposite him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man, incarnation, humanity, was the Son of God, his deity. Did you notice that the only human being besides Jesus himself and Mark the author, the only human being in the Gospel of Mark that verbally confesses Jesus as the Son of God is who? A centurion Roman soldier. For some reason, the way that Mark wrote this particular gospel account, he didn't want to include Peter's confession. He didn't want to include other people's confessions. He wanted the only human being outside of Jesus and the author. But the only human being at that time who would confess would be a Roman centurion soldier. That should be striking to us. We've had men filled with demons who confessed Jesus, right? But those were the demons. So we've had Mark the author, then we had the father on a couple of occasions, then we had demons several times. And for some reason, Mark leaves it to a centurion to be the first to confess Jesus as the Son of God, who was not Jesus himself, the first human. Has to mean something. I suggest to you it has something to do with who's the audience of Mark, the Romans. So let's kind of group some of these together. We have the term Son of God used that specific phrase three times by Mark, by demons, and by centurion. And it doesn't appear in Peter's confession in Mark. In chapter 1 and verse 11, in chapter 9 and verse 7, we have Son, and here is speaking God. And I'm going to suggest to you why God chose these two particular times to confess Jesus as His Son is the baptism emphasizes Jesus' humanity. I mean, think about it. His body is physically going under the water. His body is physically coming up out of the water. And when this happens... The Holy Spirit lands on him or comes into him, as it could literally be translated. 
And so the baptism emphasizes Jesus' humanity. It emphasizes his tie to humanity also. Because other human beings were being baptized. But the transfiguration, what do we find in that story? We find that his clothes became whiter than any launderer can get them. So what do we see in the transfiguration? Is deity being emphasized. So in the baptism, his humanity, and God says, this human being is my son in whom I am well pleased. And in the transfiguration, he changes. You no longer can focus on his humanity. You see this bright light. And God says, this is my son. Listen to him. We have in 9 verse 7, the baptism and the transfiguration, and then Jesus himself, all referring to him as the Son. Then we have these synonyms. Chapter 1 verse 24, the Holy One of God, the Son of the Most High God, chapter 5 verse 7, and chapter 14 verse 61. And what I found interesting to me was when you group into the synonyms, who do we have speaking? <laughs> Demons and Caiaphas. And I just can't look at that as just a coincidence. Maybe it is. But when synonyms were used, we find those that were lost already in the spirit world and those that were lost in the physical world. Both of them enemies of Jesus. And then you have as a last grouping. Jesus is accused of blasphemy because he said, I am. When asked, are you the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And we have in chapter 15, verse 39, the soldier, the centurion, also committing blasphemy. How is he committing blasphemy? Because as a Roman centurion, he would have given his allegiance to the Son of God, who was Caesar. And then he sees the way that Jesus dies and he says, truly this man was the Son of God. And as we understand, Jesus did not commit blasphemy. And in the idea of truth, neither did the centurion. But according to the error of the Sanhedrin and the error of Rome, they both committed blasphemy. So, did you have any surprises as to who confesses Jesus? Who does not confess Jesus? And that Peter doesn't have his confession? Who are comparative in confessing Jesus? I found it interesting that both demons and Caiaphas both used synonyms. What Son of God means? It applied to the Roman centurion or the Roman Caesars. Why and when God calls Jesus his son, one time emphasizing his humanity, the other emphasizing his divinity. How Jesus is accused of blasphemy, and it was false. And who blasphemes the son of God? The Roman centurion blasphemed the Caesar, Son of God, by saying Jesus truly was the Son of God. What's your one takeaway point? Mark teaches Jesus is divine. This is just one way. We're going to study how Mark teaches the divinity of Jesus in other lessons because it's important because 
A lot of people teach that since Mark is considered the very first gospel written to be low on the deity of Jesus. And John, which was the last, to be high on the deity of Jesus. And they say, you see, Mark really never shows that Jesus is divine. Mark never shows Jesus claiming that He is divine. John does, and the reason is, is because Jesus never truly was divine, didn't claim it. Mark knew He didn't claim it, so Mark never wrote about it. But John, later on, it did claim it because Jesus' divinity became a creation of Jesus' followers. No. The very first line that Mark wrote, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. When read, understanding the audience was Roman, and that their Caesars were called gods, and their Caesars were called sons of God, Mark declares Jesus' divinity at the very beginning. In a different way than in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's different, but when you understand the backing behind it, there is no doubt that Mark claimed Jesus was divine. What's your application and assignment? What thoughts entered your mind hearing the centurion's confession? Truly, this man was the Son of God. He was an enemy. He was part of those that were responsible for crucifying him. So when you found out that he was actually the first person that wasn't possessed by a demon to confess Jesus as the Son of God in the way that Mark wrote it, what thoughts entered into your mind? Was the Roman centurion's confession culturally acceptable considering Rome's Son of God? No. We've been studying culture and the effect that it has on us, knowingly and unknowingly. I want you to think how brave this centurion was by declaring Jesus Christ was the Son of God. That was counter to all of his allegiance before. Today, our society, Satan even, does not care if you confess Jesus is the Son of God. Society really doesn't. You, you want to claim to be a Christian? Okay, you know, you might be made fun of it. It's okay. As long as what? You go along with culture, right? You go along with society. Society, or Satan even, only cares that you live by rules that are actually not in the Bible. Don't live by the culture that we find in the Bible. Live by the culture of today. And if you confess Jesus as Son of God, that's fine as long as you, know, you accept everything that culture teaches you. And one of them is, you know, I had somebody tell me, yeah, Jesus is, is the Son of God. He's, he's divine. But so are all the Hindu gods. Somebody I work with. See, no problem believing in Jesus as the Son of God. Just, just one of many. Or what Jesus teaches about the church, what Jesus teaches about worship, what Jesus teaches about the family, which Jesus teaches about marriage, which Jesus teaches about how to be human as we've been talking about. The world doesn't care. Satan doesn't care. But just as the Roman centurion confessed something that was contrary to his culture, our lives also have to be confession of contrary to our culture too. The worst the gospel. Get your Bibles, please, and turn to chapter 12.
He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, and built a watchtower. An allusion back to Isaiah. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them. But they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully. Then he sent another, and they killed that one. He also sent many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. The ones that they beat, the ones that they were killed, are the prophets from the Old Testament. And the farmers, the nation of Israel. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Remember, this is my beloved son, Mark 1. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. They were looking for a way to arrest him, but feared the crowd because, notice this, they knew he had spoken this parable against them. They were looking for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. They were getting ready to, if they could, at all possible, within their power, fulfill the parable that Jesus spoke. That is how hard their hearts were. We open the Word of God and we read, probably more often than what we want to admit that it is written against us. So I have this question as the invitation for you. What are we wanting to keep that rightfully belongs to God and His Son? Only you can answer that for yourself. We do not have an invitation song, so if you want to respond to the invitation, please raise your hand if you want to. If not, we will have a closing prayer.